So you live in the society that is openly aggressive. There are things that you cannot discuss. Some of these people are brainwashed beyond repair. Propaganda works. It's cancer that just kills brains. Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's a drama of the post-Soviet history. Putin has fallen for his own conspiracy theories. He got disconnected from reality. Hi everyone, my name is Andre. Welcome to another episode of our video podcast about things and thank you very much for tuning in. As you can see, uh, we're filming in a, in a different place today and that is because we are in Sheffield where we are meeting our today's guest, Ilya Yablokov, a lecturer in uh, uh, journalism and digital media at the University of Sheffield and the author of several great books on media, propaganda and conspiracy theories. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Hi, Andre. Hi. Why do people believe conspiracy theories? Because it makes life, makes the world much easier to understand and sort of cope with uh, the complexity of this world. When you look at any conspiracy theory, yeah. uh, you're going to see several elements. So element one is there is a secret group of people, of creatures that doesn't like the rest of the world. So they accumulate power in their hands and they create a plan according to which they are going to make life of this majority of, of people people amongst whom these conspiracy theories usually emerge, so miserable, so difficult, that people are going to suffer. So uh, when a person starts believing in conspiracy theories, he, she starts believing in these things, not because of how great the life is. It's rather because people suffer and people want to find explanations for misfortunes, for troubles, for problems, for accidents. Therefore, they use conspiracy theories and you use those secret societies, secret groups of, pe of people to blame for their problems. So by blaming those external actors, real or imagined, right? people find the complexity, they reduce the complexity of the world to this um, division between the good guys and the bad guys. And the bad guys are always kind of powerful mm -hmm. creatures. From my experience, uh, having grown up in the very post-Soviet environment, mm -hmm. Um, I definitely encountered um, a lot of examples of people generally believing conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And whilst in the West, um, obviously they have a lot of stuff, a lot of a lot of that stuff as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, such as QAnon or mm -hmm. um, baby eating lizards, etc. Uh, I always felt like in the West, these sort of ideas are kind of marginalized. Whilst in Russia. Um, they are quite they are quite popular mm -hmm. generally mm -hmm. and i was wondering uh why that is that in russia and generally the post soviet region uh conspiracy theories are much more popular than uh, among the general public than in the west in a way it's um it, it's the heritage of the soviet union uh conspiracy theories emerge not because again they don't emerge because people would like to create them out of fun well, you can create a conspiracy theory out of fun. That's fine. That's fine. Um, the heritage of the Soviet Union it has this kind of essential distrust to institutions, essential distrust to individuals and organizations, right? You don't trust anyone, uh, which automatically creates a very fruitful ground for conspiracy theory, for beliefs in conspiracy theories. Uh, so Soviet heritage is one thing. Second thing is how uh, the reforms in the post-socialist bloc, let's put it that way, it's the post-socialist bloc, 
how economic reforms, how political reforms were carried out. Uh, they came unexpected. They were extremely painful for the majority of the population. The outcome of these reforms benefited a few rather than many. Well, a lot of people benefited from market economy eventually, right? But only few were actually successful, right? Mm -hmm. And the third factor is, well, in the case of Russia, it's certainly the uh, gradual destruction of the institutions of <coughs> democracy, the uh, growth of authoritarianism, destruction of media and turning the media into propaganda and into tabloids, that together created a very sort of friendly environment for anyone who believes in conspiracy theories because you're not going to be a marginal. Mm -hmm. You'll be a normal guy with a, a rather usual belief, mm -hmm. right? You are not going to be ostracized like you would be, I don't know, anyway, in the UK, in, in the US, probably not every time, but still. But you're going to be just one of those guys who believes in yet another conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. So that's, in a way, there was a process of normalization of conspiracy theories in the post-Soviet period. Therefore, they're so, um, they, <laughs> they could be found every, anywhere. Uh, I mean, I think you kind of alluded to that already as well, but do you think an important aspect of this is um, relativization of truth? Uh, the sort of approach that I think Peter Pomerantsev mm -hmm, described mm -hmm, in his book mm -hmm, uh, called mm -hmm. uh, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my mind, at least, you know, observing some of my distant relatives, etc., uh, from the region, uh, it always appeared to me that they almost didn't know what to believe because for the majority of their lives mm -hmm. uh, growing up in the Soviet Union, uh, they, they were told they, they, they were being taught one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, then all of a sudden, this all fell apart, mm -hmm. all fell down. And they were told that mm -hmm. everything that, we, that, that you know, you've been taught mm -hmm. up until now mm -hmm. was false, was mm -hmm. not true. Yeah. Uh, then we had the period of the, you know, this 1990s where journalism was kind of like free for all uh, mm -hmm. in Russia, at least. Uh, and, um, and then obviously with uh, Putin, state came in control, mm -hmm. in control of the media. And once again, uh, the propaganda, the Soviet style, even propaganda was, mm -hmm. was reinstated. Mm -hmm. uh, so for these people, uh, at least from my perspective, it, it, it appears that they are confused. And uh, because of all these things that happened to them, these because of certain historical events, uh, they just literally do not know what to believe. And even when you say, well, but actually, uh, you know, you can you can always follow um, Western media, you can follow BBC Russia or whatever. Uh, they, they will say something like, once again, relativization of truth, they will say something like, I mean, they lie as much as as much as our guys lie. But because they are the enemies, they are the outsiders. I'd rather mm -hmm. believe my guys mm -hmm. here in Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a very recent example. Uh, what happens now in the war, right? The very first reaction of many people, many Russian people I spoke to in, in the first couple of weeks, even today, what they say, uh, Russia probably is doing bad things, but we don't know the whole truth. And Ukraine probably is doing the same things, right? So let's wait and see. Probably in some like a few, in a few years time, we're going to know for sure what happened, right? So do not take this side. Wait, right? And that's one of the examples, one of the most recent examples to where it all came. You cannot you I, I agree, you cannot trust let's say, Vladimir Posner, who is the uh, m most renowned propaganda guy, right, in the 1970s and 1980s, who then switched to professional journalism. And now, where is he now? He's not 
saying a word for like for four weeks or so. And you've got you, you, you've got like loads of people who might read quality newspapers, mm -hmm. but would still have this notion of but probably maybe something is there, like maybe they've made a contract with someone, or maybe they are paid for that. Like so you gotta you always have this this uh, note of criticism of capitalism. That you can buy everything, right? This kind of it's a right. weird spirit of post-Soviet transformation. Nothing is uh, genuine, but you can always pay someone money to make a cool copy of democracy, to make a cool copy of journalism, right? A fake one, mm -hmm. a plastic one, the one that is going to collapse soon. But money decided all. Money is an incredible factor here. Because, I mean, post-Soviet societies generally are very poor. And people try to compensate uh, the, the financial problems, their class problems in many ways, and corruption by believing, by kind of constructing an additional part in this reality, a new dim dimension, which is very conspiratorial, which is in a way real because there are a lot of influential guys who really make real plots, like Vladimir Putin, right, and Novichok and all this stuff. We kind of now can guess that probably he was involved in that, right? And... And, and, and in, indeed, you're going to have quite a lot of people who will be just lost. They will not know what to believe. And it would be much safer to address those problems of their own safety, of safety of their children, of safety of their future, which probably, you know, everyone is going to have a pretty bleak future, right? But they're going to say, well... We'd rather not trust anyone and sort of keep the status quo rather than do any change. Like, we, we're going to support any reforms. And we know what happens. You know, we, we unfortunately witness it these days. So what does it boil down to, these feelings? Do they boil down to comfort, mm -hmm. I guess, because it's comfortable uh, to to believe these mm -hmm. to believe these things and actually you know not to believe anything and just mm -hmm. say well who knows what what, what is true mm -hmm. or where where the truth is and then the second thing that is kind of obvious to me is apathy apathy and um, understanding that you cannot or persuasion in a way that you cannot change anything mm -hmm. in Russian within you know mm -hmm. within the Russian political system. Uh, and since you can't really change anything, why why should you why should you even try? And as a result of that, many, and I don't really blame them because obviously we know what happened to certain uh, Russian businessmen, what happened to Russian opposition figures when they criticized the government. Uh, but yeah, so so the majority of people uh, appear to have chosen a very comfortable position, uh, a very apathetic one, where they say, for example, Russian businessmen, they just say, well we prefer to stay out of politics. And this whole thing about staying mm -hmm, out of mm -hmm, politics mm -hmm. almost sounds like an excuse. Mm -hmm. So would you say these are these are the drivers behind uh, behind these mechanisms? So the uh, so comfort, uh, apathy, and an attempt to uh, justify their inaction and justify their indifference? Um, absolutely agree. I would just maybe amend, mm -hmm. I'll just put a, slash to comfort and add stability stability because comfort mm -hmm. i wouldn't describe the lives of majority of russians mm -hmm. let's speak for for the russians now that they live in a super comfortable life they're not right but they're too afraid to lose at least this stability Right. I'm not a, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a political scientist, but for what we see in the sociological polls, it is about we need to protect the status quo. 
we've got something, we have achieved something, there is some sort of stability, so let's keep it. But to be fair, there is no stability from 2010 in Russia. It's in decline. Economically, it's in decline. Why are you saying 2010, not 2014? Um, I think the economy didn't really recover from the world economic crisis. And plus, then there was the shock of Putin coming back to the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. And we see, like, from 2012, they were kind of the, the investments were not going up. But again, this is rather the question to economists and political scientists. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a lack of comfort. It's, a, it's an imagined comfort. It's... Uh, um, Okay, like I think I think many of your viewers have seen the um, flash mob on social media with the Z, right? And you've seen all these probably appalling photos of the Russians standing with the A4 piece of paper, and in the background, I'm not even talking about kids, but in the background you can see. And absolutely devastated houses, absolutely like crumbling apart, flats, buildings, apartments. Probably, you know, they've had their renovation maybe a dozen years ago. <laughs> but it's, they, these people, they cannot afford a lot. Probably they're hardly making ends meet. But what they see, this kind of the visual component of this stability and the embodiment of which is Vladimir Putin, uh, it gives them this sense of, okay, the same leader kind of saying the right things, we've got military power, we can, in theory, take a mortgage, take a loan, buy a car, or maybe kind of take a loan to survive. And that's it. But at least we can afford that. And God knows what can happen if, if this whole thing disappears. So this is the kind of comfort they live. And certainly there's plenty of conspiracy theories and distrust and apathy coming out of this situation. What would you say are the most common uh, the most widely believed conspiracy theories in Russia? At the moment. Yeah, is it like, you know, the Western threat of NATO? Yeah, that's the most obvious one. But that's, mm, that's, let's put it that way, that's complex right now. And if you analyze closely what Putin says, what he said on 21st of February, what he said on the 24th, what he said later... It's really nicely tied together now. So the first one is the, the fear of the Western conspiracy against Russia. Ukraine used as um, a stage for attack against Russia. So Ukraine turned into a um, peculiar puppet state, which has no population, but rather zombies. Again, everything is quotation of mark. Uh, and then why Ukraine is important and, and dangerous, because it's, um, it's a testing ground for all sorts of experiments. And it's, it's an experiment on gender. So funnily enough, all these things that uh, uh, the Kremlin was kind of experimenting and, and promoting for social cohesion throughout the 2010 uh, anti-Western uh, feelings, um, hatred uh, towards Ukraine, hatred towards the LGBT, it all tied together in this military campaign against Ukraine. Uh, because Ukraine is not just the puppet state, but it has no agency, and it's just an obstacle for, for Russia. But at the same time, it is the uh, mm, it, it, it is going to sort of strip the Slavic nations of their spiritual 
soul and will immerse itself into the spiritualless, uh, homosexual kind of orgy, if you wish. And it all boils down. If you look at, at all these kind of Channel One, Russia Channel programs, if you listen to, like, li read Telegram channels, the three main pillars, and they help to sort of justify what Russia is doing now in Ukraine, and it, it helps justify to these millions of people who actually live in this comfort, right, why doing the things in Ukraine is good. Apart from the fact for, that some actually enjoy this manifestation of power, this manifestation of weaponry, which is terrible, right, disgusting. Given we started talking about the, I mean, it's almost impossible to not, not to talk about the Russian invasion of Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, that started in February 2022 and is currently ongoing. Um, but from the very beginning, we could see um, that most likely Putin and his inner circle, uh, has pro uh, they have probably miscalculated mm -hmm. with, with, with the entire invasion. Uh, you can see that based on the amount of losses that the Russian army is currently uh, suffering, even including say, senior generals, for example. Um, you can see that also by quite limited military gains, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a couple of weeks now. So, and you know, now you get to read a lot of media reports and a lot of allegedly insider sort of reports or mm -hmm. information about Putin um, basically receiving incorrect information mm -hmm. from his closest advisors, military advisors, etc. Um, which I do not necessarily want to call conspiracy theories, but definitely something that in a way diverges from the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, so could we potentially say that uh, Putin has fallen for his own conspiracy theories? Fears. Yeah, uh, and I have changed my mind. I have... I have to say that when the war began, I had to reconsider a couple of findings from my book. I have always thought that Vladimir Putin is certain like any other human being is prone to conspiracy theories. We all believe in conspiracy theories. It's just needless to explain, right? But I thought that there are beliefs of a human being and there are political calculations. And what happens, how the invasion is justified, it certainly has a peculiar rationale behind. If you look at what he does when the attack is done, uh, it probably kind of in his mind and in the mind of people who kind of supported this act, I think it's, they explain it not conspiratorially, but rather as like a big game against the United States. Because essentially it all boils down to Russia against the United States. Ukraine is just a proxy here. But now I also believe that Vladimir Putin personally probably believes in the anti-Western conspiracy theories which probably happened because he got disconnected from reality. Something that observers noted many months ago, that living in, the, in, the, in a very isolated environment, being fed by specific you know, guys, oligarchs, whoever you, you call them, a specific type of information, being always kind of being always on Zoom in a way, right? Mm -hmm. So he, I think he just lost the touch with reality and miscalculated it that way. So his own fears of Russia being attacked, and I don't know who was feeding this fire uh, in his mind, but he definitely thought that attacking now is the right time politically? Again, uh, Merkel is gone. 
uh, the French President Macron is not able to sustain this attack. Americans has the old guy Biden, and probably we shouldn't really worry about them. Plus, see how Americans left Afghanistan. And yeah, probably it is the right time to attack Ukraine and kind of make sure that we settle here and we sort of defend what has been conquered because the West is weak. We can always kind of, we, we will be ahead of them. So that was a major miscalculation, I think. But he was driven by the conspiratorial fear that was probably ingrained, and I'm writing about it in this book, it was probably ingrained in 2004 with the first Maidan in Ukraine when uh, essentially kind of the first battle of this geopolitical war was lost. The problem was that at that time, both sides, I think the Americans too, saw it as the battleground because for George Bush, this promotion of democracy was critical, right? And he, wa he was not hiding his intentions to democratize everything, right? At any cost, even Iraq, right? Uh, and this first battle and this first lost battle, I think, started that kind of fear of the West, which also overlapped with the fear to lose the power in the country. And it was in 2004, and there you go. We are in 2022 now, and see what happens. Mm. So would you say... Um would you say that the you know NATO and the U.S. expansion um, is not entirely an invention of Russian propaganda? Because that's what I always thought. I always thought to myself because I always uh, would always hear uh, the Russian state TV talking about this expansionist NATO and how they're trying to and NATO. Obviously, we mean the United States, mm -hmm. and how they're trying to you know get Russia mm -hmm. at all costs or whatever the reason behind that is. Uh, but from what you said is that there was a genuine competition, you know, in the early 2000s over Ukraine that Putin has lost. Um, so would you disagree with the fact that, you know, this threat of NATO is, is, is an invention of Russian propaganda? Uh, it is an invention. Let's put it that way. NATO, uh, in my point of view, should have been disbanded back in the early 1990s. That should have been part of the deal. Uh, between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. Because the whole point of NATO, it was the Cold War, right? Yeah. And in we remember that in the early 1990s, late 1980s, the attitudes towards the West were extremely popular, extremely positive. The opening of the first McDonald's. The opening of the first McDonald's, the closing of the first McDonald's a few weeks ago. Um... Okay, so back in the day, if well, whoever it was, George Bush, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, Yeltsin, whoever could have made that decision to close NATO and really start from page one, probably it would have been a different history of the late 20s, beginning of the 21st century. That's interesting. It stayed mm -hmm. and it changed the course, certainly, of the Russian nationalism and Russian anti-Western attitudes. Because NATO was key in, in bombing Serbia, right? And bombing of Serbia was one of the biggest nightmares of many in the Russian establishment. They really saw it as if they were bombed bombed they were seeing themselves as those serbs and we remember that the most pro-western russian politician well aside of gorbachev boris yeltsin was saying hey you what you're doing is wrong like bill clinton wait you remember there was very famous footage of him in china i think when he was just basically threatening bill clinton and and yeah and they sent the um Say send Russian soldiers to Kosovo in 1999 to the airport. So 
that was the turning point. Yet, I do want to say that it's all NATO's fault. It's much more complex. It's the NATO that stayed and was not closed. And the NATO that throughout the 2000s that was basically trumpeting this card of Russia being the enemy was used by the Russian kind of pro... I wouldn't get like pro-Putin, but anti-Western intellectuals, anti-Western politicians as a boogeyman. And that boogeyman reappeared, re-emerged. So that's, that's, that's a drama of the post-Soviet history. One thing was not resolved, another thing appeared, and it helped to return to this state of affairs where Russia again stands against the West, like in the good old days of the Cold War. And the architecture of global security should be different, but it's not anymore. And we don't know how it's going to look like now because things are so shaky and, and the world is so different. So probably there were different options back then in 1992, 1993 to disband NATO, to turn it into the global security network. But the American side also made a few mistakes. And one of them was was Serbia. And another one was Iraq. Because everything that the Russian side is trying to do in Ukraine, if you look at it, it's very much coping what Americans were doing in, in Iraq, just to give this example of bioweapons. Mm -hmm. Right. Allegedly found. Right. Um, yeah, that's what the Russian propaganda currently is using, and Putin loves this uh, loves this strategy as well of what about is right? Mm. They would always mm. whenever, they adore it. Yeah. Whenever they are accused of something, they they would always say, "Well, what about mm. yeah, when yeah, you bombed yeah, somebody? Yeah. What about when this happened 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 in your country?" But coming back maybe to those bioweapons and this sort of stuff, actually, this is quite interesting. You follow Russian propaganda and like Russian state TV channels and what they are talking about. And when I watch it, it for me, it's sometimes, not sometimes, it genuinely appears to me as a completely parallel reality, what, mm -hmm. what, they, what they are presenting uh, to the Russian population. Uh, I remember at least like, I don't know, first or even second week into the war, uh, this speaker for the Russian military, he was genuinely talking about how the Ukrainian army isn't really doing anything and they're just fighting these Nazis, these like small uh, group of Nazis that, you know, drive Bandero mobiles and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. So I was just, I, was just I, I basically just wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about the key concepts used currently by the Russian propaganda um, to justify the war, number one, and number two, to explain what they are doing at the moment and to present their, I could say point of view, but I will say parallel reality. Uh, the reality of Russian propaganda, mm, and no matter how absurd it sounds, is based on several premises. It's premise number one, we are not waging the war against Ukraine. We're waging the war against the so-called Nazis uh, that are supported by the West. Um, so again, every conspiracy theory has the factual, sort of kind of a, a grain of truth, a grain of facts, and then a huge bit of lies, right? The huge cloud of lies. So the reality is, are there any radical nationalists in Ukraine? Probably yes. Like in uh, any other country. Exactly, right? Are there any radical nationalists in Russia? Plenty. Is Ukraine supported by NATO? Is Ukraine supported by the Western countries? I'm sorry, it's being reported. Right, UK delivered weapons, uh, a lot of Estonia delivered, so lots of countries. Yeah, yeah. Why are they doing that? Well, to support their independence, to help Ukrainians to defend their country. Um, third, these bioweapons, it's, it's a total hoax, 
but it's just yet another example of how the Russian side tries to justify what's what's been done so far and what's going to be done. So what was it exactly, just to come back to that theory of bioweapons? Is it to contage uh, bats and mosquitoes that will then migrate yeah. to Russia and yeah. give everyone some yeah. terrible diseases, yeah. including Probably. plague? Uh, I think, well, I, I, as, a, as a scholar, as an academic, I tend to overthink, right? But probably it's an attempt to connect coronavirus fears with uh, kind of with the fears of the West, because uh, notably a lot of these audiences that shared anti-COVID-19 conspiracy theories believe that it never existed, that the government is trying to kill us all, brainwash, whatever. A lot of these people hated the Kremlin in the last couple of years. So Putin was losing his electorate in this. And we see how quickly uh, the Kremlin backtracked. Uh, and, and we see how quickly it changed its policy towards QR codes last year. Mm -hmm. It was just amazing to look at. Basically, the Kremlin, first time in its history, gave up to put forward a very serious legislation to protect health because the, uh, uh, the, 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 the grassroots organizations of those anti-COVID or COVID deniers mm -hmm. were so strong mm -hmm. that the Kremlin decided not to deal with them. It's better to avoid it. It's better to please them. It's better to change legislation, right? So these bioweapons probably is an invention just to kind of to grab those groups and communities who sort of believe that it's Americans who invented coronavirus to, to bring them on board, to kind of say, hey, guys, we are trying to prove now that coronavirus was invented. Whatever works, whoever is going to, to, to be friends with us at this moment, the Kremlin thinks, yeah, I guess, let's take them on board. Um, and, and as I said, the, the, the fourth kind of conspiracy theory, the fourth pillar of this misinformation is that if we don't wage the war right now, uh, we then will allow a, a bigger war in Europe, in the world, and B, if we lose, our country will be turned into whatever kind of homosexual heaven. They really think about that. Like, you're laughing, but, but these guys genuinely believe that there is, a, there is a danger of losing our identity and of our moral kind of, mm, mm, our moral victory in, in being Russians and being so spiritual and being so orthodox. When I'm thinking about all these arguments that the Russian propaganda pushes, be it biological weapons, be it uh, non-existent Nazis in Ukraine, in power in Ukraine, you know, embodied by President Zelensky, who's an ethnic Jew, mm -hmm. uh, and many, many others, all these arguments and all uh, that pushed by the Russian propaganda sound so ridiculous mm -hmm. um, that. For me, as a, as a person who doesn't live in Russia, it's striking that people would even believe this sort of stuff. And uh, particularly in Russia, because until recently, until the war in Ukraine, basically, Russia was not Turkmenistan. Russia was not Azerbaijan. It wasn't, you know, it still had independent media, despite the fact that, it wasn't, that they were not broadcasted on, the, on TV. You know, you had to pay subscription or you had to watch them on YouTube. But uh, Russia still had independent journalism mm -hmm. and, you know, very high quality independent journalism where people uh, could get their information from. So um, what I sort of still fail to understand is uh, how is it possible that all these things were so effective, mm -hmm. basically? Uh, and how is it possible that so many people uh, are currently, in a way, supporting the mm -hmm. war? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, first of all, because many people were fed by the very similar 
junk food of propaganda for many years, right? Propaganda is not something that, you know, kind of can change your mind immediately. If it's a if it's a longitudinal process, if it's a process that goes for well, it now goes for more than fifteen years. It actually there's a whole generation that grew up potentially watching this, right, or consuming this uh, content. Uh, second, independent media. Independent media is a great thing but it's a great thing when it works in a competitive market so professional high quality media are efficient sometimes again mind you brexit right it it actually happened largely because of disinformation so independent media were extremely popular in the 1990s, there were a lot of questions about to what extent they were independent, to what extent they were professional, yet uh, there was audience for them. But that audience also changed. Some people from this audience, you know, switched to alternative channels. They actually switched to the online news. And a lot of online news have also been turned into pro Kremlin. And as a result, people who wanted and who still want to consume high quality information and high quality journalism, they need to make an effort to get it. So now the Kremlin made everything to prevent people from getting access to the quality information. So you need to make an incredible effort. You need to install a VPN. We need to install an application. You need to make sure that if the police stops you in the street. Oh yeah, that's been happening. They, they, yeah. they, they, they won't find what kind of media you read. So it's actually now, it's almost a heroic deed. So, um, and certainly the third factor is that we thought that the internet is going to liberate us, right? Back in the 1990s, we all had these kind of dreams and feelings that it's going to be awesome. You know, that's the free stage for all sorts of ideas and everyone is going to find whatever he, she wants to be happy online, even drugs. Uh, and what, what happens now? We all see these echo chambers, we see that the social media that first gave us liberation, like VK, now is basically just the, you know, one step closer uh, to the uh, FSB, right? So if you write there, if you exchange messages, everything will be on the desk of the next, you know, officer who monitors VK in your region. Easy, right? And that the freest media telegram, right, that was so tech-savvy in 2018, now is probably totally infiltrated by the pro-Kremlin uh, blogs, but also probably sold its independence to the Russian intelligence, although I don't have evidence of that, but probably... Uh, what do they do? They provoke people to say something? No, no, it's uh, uh, this encryption thing. The encryption, there are, there are a lot of rumors. Again, it's rumors that the encryption, peer-to-peer -peer encryption, is not really working on Telegram anymore. So it's not so uh, protected as, as, as it used to be. Interesting. Well, that, therefore, everyone is on Signal now. Right, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it is... It was a process of for, that was going for many, many years, Andre. And first it was the traditional media, television and newspapers. Then it was online, uh, creating parallel realities of like Vzgliat and Kommersant. And then 
destroying Komersan basically, and then destroying Lentaru, and then blocking Medusa, and then inter introducing the foreign agents law. So it's like kind of it was all coming step by step, just to ensure it's the freedom of speech should be squeezed out. It sh they should not exist there. Because it's it's dangerous. That's it. It's dangerous because if people see what kind of reality they live in, li they, live in they might know that specific element of reality that really pisses them off. Like how much corruption is in their neighborhood or how rich their boss is, who is some sort of a local deputy. Or, um, uh, for example, this tiny element of, I don't know, corruption of police. Everyone knows that, right? But the impression that is created by propaganda, that Russia is great, it's encircled by enemies, blah, 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 has a downside, and the downside is, and every citizen in Russia knows that and realizes that. That's a, that's a pretty Soviet skill. There's quite a lot of power here, and lo so much police, so much FBI, uh, sorry, FSB, so much kind of domestic force that will destroy you instantly, right? But, and there's another thing which is very important. The another thing is propaganda works only when it refers to an object that you personally don't know. So it's so easy to brag about the United States or Czech Republic or Israel or Ukraine. How many people have actually been there? How many people really have, like people who currently live there, Sorry, but that's what's 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 striking in this case specifically. Yeah. No, the yeah. fact that the fact that there are so many Russians. I mean, so many Russians have relatives, have friends in mm -hmm. Ukraine, mm -hmm. and I've heard some crazy stories, uh, such as I don't know, kids calling their parents who like kids who live in Ukraine calling their parents who live in Russia, saying, "Okay, the level of destruction of Kharkov or Mariupol." is ridiculous like you know they're just bombing they're just basically burning the cities down mm -hmm. the, like to the ground and the parents would just not believe them mm -hmm. and say it's fake news or whatever so the level of it, it almost appears to me as some of these people are brainwashed beyond repair in mm -hmm. a way yeah uh, i agree it's 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 very bad in terms of how deep uh this brainwashing process took place. It's it's just, I I I it's it's been it's a f fourth week now of the war, and every day I just you know I ask myself, what needs to be done to all this population now? Like what kind of therapy, what sort of media literacy courses should everyone take to get rid of the of this disease? It's cancer that just kills brains. Um, that's an interesting thing, but also I think it's largely to the point that those parents and those members, family members, they really live in this absolutely imagined reality of Russian media, largely media, they just do not consume any alternative news. So for them, this is reality. And when I give you an alternative reality by calling and saying, hey, it, things are really not what you see on the TV, for them, coping with this message means destroying the world in which they live. It's not an easy process. This process can kill. So they're not going to do that. They would rather say, you, it's, it's, not, it's not the Ukrainian, it's not the Russian army, sorry. It's, and that's, that is a, a very popular explanation. It's the Ukrainian army that puts uh, tanks, guns, whatever, snipers on this building 
So they use it as a target for the Russian force. And the Russian army must do that because they need to protect Russian citizens, Russian soldiers. So it is the, so it's kind of a, this conspiratorial image of any a, a bad guys in the government, a bad guys in the Ukrainian army that basically behave like partisans, uh, that do whatever to survive, and they put, use civilians as a shield. And you, you then kind of the next line of argument would be, even if it happens here and there, imagine, probably it can happen, we don't know, but who invaded? Why have the Russian forces invaded? So, I mean, Wait a second, let's go to the square one. Let's ask ourselves, like, why have we ended up in this point where we argue whether it was worse or not destroying that apartment block? And sorry, let's talk about that. We won't talk about it because this is going this is this is something that is going to shatter the reality of an ordinary Russian who is on the diet of Russian propaganda. And this is the, this is just, this is the situation from where it really is difficult to get out for an individual, even for an individual, but for the whole society, it's just impossible to. Wow. Um, yeah, I remember when you mentioned the uh, shelling of the buildings mm -hmm. where uh, you know, Ukrainian soldiers or the Nazi soldiers or whatever they call them. Quote unquote. Yeah, yeah, allegedly, allegedly, station, uh, allegedly get stationed in, and then they, they allegedly get bombed by the Russian army. There was this absolutely disgusting story about the maternity hospital yeah. that the Russian army ap appeared to have deliberately bombed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and apart from the whole thing about um, Ukrainian Nazis uh, hiding on mm -hmm. in that building or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, allegedly, mm -hmm. um, uh, they were also they were also doing this. When I was like, how lowly can it get? When they were taking a pic, uh, when they were taking those pictures of those women mm -hmm. who survived the bombing, uh, walking out of the hospital or being carried uh, carried from that hospital. Mm -hmm. And like comparing two completely different women mm -hmm. saying this is the same Ukrainian actress that wasn't even pregnant. Mm -hmm. And any normal person would be one Google search away from finding out that this is not true, that this is not a Ukrainian actress. Uh, this person was actually pregnant if you go on her Instagram page, etc. And this is all identifiable. You can find this very easily. And people still believe this sort of stuff even when it's so gruesome and disgusting and i'm sorry i was just going to quickly quickly mention this example that i mentioned to you just before we started we started this episode uh so i have this i have this person who lives in russia that i know uh and they as long as i remember them they've hated putin and as long as i remember them they've been telling me uh, that, you know, everything you hear on the Russian state TV is pure propaganda and you can't believe that. But then at the same time, despite the fact that they know uh, that basically Russian propaganda serves you with a lie, uh, this person still repeats these things mm -hmm. to me when we are talking, for example, about the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that's what scares me, mm -hmm. that even people who are generally skeptical about the government mm -hmm. are already will already brought to such point where they literally just i don't even know how to describe it how many people that you know made this google search and checked this hospital and this actress it's too much work yeah i guess you're too lazy to do that absolutely you've got an overload of information which uh you have to consume somehow and lots of people do consume it like Look at the public transportation. Like people go in, they sit or they stand, they open their cell phone and they consume, 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 right? So will they make this extra step to verify that? Uh, will they make this extra step to not to share this? That's a first point. The second point, 
the person you're describing is certainly is a very interesting kind of example. Uh, but I really don't know. I'm not a psychologist again. But I would say uh, it is a coping strategy. So you live in the society that is openly aggressive. There are things that you cannot discuss. There are things that you cannot uh, agree on publicly. At the same time, you have your own biases, right? Probably one of your biases is that everyone lies. And uh, there is no thing as professional media. Everyone lies. So think about it. People who would support Vladimir Putin, they would they would do it openly. Some would not show the open support, but they would still buy into certain ideas. Because this propaganda works in multiple ways to bring in the support groups. Some people would hate LGBT. Some people would be supportive of Vladimir Putin. Some would do mm, support, I don't know, uh, Dushe, anti-Western and kind of pretty hardcore far-right ideas that traditionally were not the supporting group of Vladimir Putin. But th during the this extreme time of the war, they all come together because the war, this the very moment of the war, creates this uh, feeling that political scientists called rally around the flag. The same was in 2001 in the United States. The same was in the United Kingdom when the terrorist attacks. So these events do create temporarily a majority that sort of needs to, you know, it's like we got a leader and we've got a mob, right? And so we kind of, as individuals, we really don't know what to do. We have this peer pressure. We have um, kind of uh, other conditions, law regulations, customs. And we've got a guy who kind of knows what to do, right? And so in this critical moment, when especially when you're bombarded from this side, from this channel, from that channel, you need to decide what you're going to do. So probably most, most people would go together with the flow because going against the flow at that particular moment is dangerous at least, right? It can kill you in the worst case scenario or you can end up in the prison. Because everything, like the ground for that was created very quickly, right? So in that particular case, I would say that probably there have been or there are some kind of uh, uh, beliefs, prior beliefs in conspiracy theories that turned into uh, the support of what this person sees on the TV. Mm -hmm. No, understood. Uh this whole rally around the flag thing, it was obvious to me, for example, when uh, Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, mm -hmm. because many Russians always believed that Crimea was something that belonged to Russia. Mm -hmm. But um, I felt like this wasn't going to happen now with a full on invasion mm -hmm. uh, against Ukraine, because at least from my view, a lot of people would be like, why the hell would we do this? It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. And because of that, uh, and a lot of people at the start as well, they were saying, well, the rally around the flag, you know, is not going to happen this time because people, you know, don't really want to have a war, to have a proper war uh, with Ukraine, etc. But despite that, it seems that, you know, the propaganda, the Russian TV propaganda, which I would always mock mm -hmm. because it's so ridiculous and absurd, actually turned out to be so efficient, so effective mm -hmm. Uh, that they still manage to persuade so many people that, you know, that whatever Putin is currently doing in Ukraine is actually a good thing. Do you believe um, the results of those polls, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, we have to take them with a pinch of salt, depending on methodology, etc. But do you believe that, you know, at least 50 to 60 percent of Russians currently support this war? And, you know, in one way or another, in, yeah. way, yeah. in one way or another, yes. 
Um, but again, uh, it's difficult to say in the time of war how many people like genuinely support a certain claim or a leadership. It 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 is a very kind of dirty results you're gonna get. I would say, the like I, I, it's 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 really difficult to say for sure the number of people. Although um, on Medusa uh, last week there was an interesting podcast by sociologists who explains them their methodology and they uh, and their findings. Indeed, the majority supports that. And it's the people with uh, probably high income, which is also interesting, and people who kind of consume the content created by state-affiliated media. So it is a sad outcome, indeed. But at the same time, the kind of the, the it's it's a very it was a very long process i repeat that and we came to that point not in 2004 in 2004 that would not be possible we came to that in 2022 lots of the institutions and lots of the people who were possible who had the potential to prevent that are not there if you, if you if you like i've been thinking a lot about that but if you look at where russia was going for all last years so all these foreign agents laws why uh then the destruction of memorial last year then this wave of destruction of independent media at least financially then, okay, we forget about politics, right? We forget about political parties. Like kind of the state parliament is is a poorly working mechanism that needs to be replaced. But if you do all these things, where are you going to end up? So what sorts of society are you going to create? And you will definitely want to make sure that there will be some sort of ideological framework to have in place to make sure that people are following you. And this is the time when, let's say, well, 50%, Putin always had 50% in a way. It certainly there's a core electorate. I would, I would assess it around 20, 25%, like really core Putin guys. There will be some fellow travelers. There will be lots of people like, oh, let's look at this side and that side. Oh, there's all oh, the, the, the life is all about like shades of gray. No, there are principles and there are values. And it's difficult sometimes to follow your principles, but you must if you really want to save and protect your country. So now we definitely see that a majority of the population supports Putin one way or another, or at least the special military operation. Uh, but a certain part of it, I would say the majority of this majority, will quickly fall apart because it is not a solid core of electorate. It's kind of, they buy into that because they like it, like what they see, they think their life is going okay so far. Uh, but once they feel that sanctions are biting, that the level of life mm -hmm. went down, they will probably get disillusioned. And I'm not saying they're going to become anti-Putin. No, they probably will just cope with that, as Russians very often did historically. But they will certainly be changing their attitude from support to the fear and the fear will be sustained by the ever-present intelligence that is everywhere in russia so the picture is going to be grim in the next few years
Ilya, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate that. I think we could speak for hours about this, and I find this topic extremely interesting. Um, just before we finish, and we are, are unfortunately are running out of time, mm-hmm. but just before we finish, uh, I would like to ask you a question that I uh, always ask at the end of each mm-hmm. episode, um, and that is, if you could change one thing in the world, uh, what would it be? Media literacy. <laughs> I would definitely uh, introduce uh, media literacy and uh, in kind of this, this skill. I would put it in, in kindergarten, really. Because the because the toys which which we which toddlers are playing nowadays they're also based on on a very kind of primitive psychological uh, uh, skills and which then brings us to uh, smartphones and other media so yeah it's definitely media literacy so when you say media literacy could you expand on that what do you mean by that critical assessment of what we consume but critical kind of not to the extent that everyone lies. Critics like, okay, why do I see it? What does it mean? Uh, what's the message? Uh, can we understand uh, sort of the objective of this report? So not just consuming what we are fed, but trying to understand where they come from and try not to multiply uh, fears and misinformation uh even if if it fits our worldview just don't it's really difficult it's almost probably impossible within the life of one generation but as i can see it, it had to be done and it needs to be done when the whole thing is hopefully over soon mm-hmm. uh, this actually reminded me of this famous picture uh on social media you know Uh, posted quite often by people who you know like to so sympathize with this thinking about mm-hmm. everyone has their own truth etc mm-hmm. it's like two people uh it's like a number six or number nine mm-hmm. written on the ground and two people standing opposite mm-hmm. uh, and claiming one of them claiming this is number six mm-hmm. another one claiming this is number nine mm-hmm. and being like and you know there's like little text next to it a little caption saying um See, for this person it's number six, for this person it's number nine. Truth is relative. It depends on how you see it. But then you're like, well, no, because somebody came there, somebody wrote that number on that on, on the floor, meaning it to be either six or either nine. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that you know you I, I guess I guess I guess that kind of It's a smoke of subjectivity that is called. It's uh uh there there are some there are some articles about that that's uh Uh, French philosophers of the late 20th century sort of created all these postmodern concepts like Jean Baudrillard, like simulation, etc. And everything is relative and therefore we need to be very kind of cautious about that. But, uh, and as these authors claim that it's that, that what happened with our world, like everything became so relative and therefore we sort of forgotten what the What the reality is, right? That there is good thing and there's bad thing. There are good guys and there are bad guys. And you cannot just whitewash the bad guys and saying, well, actually, he meant that. He really genuinely wanted to save the people of the Donbass. And that's why the, he kind of destroyed the whole, you know, the, the whole country. And he, well, but he's been trying to be good. No. It's like we sort of cross the line where this subjectivity should be just you know pushed aside and say well this is the reality and this is your illusions so stop living in illusions this is this must be the disillusional moment for at least the european nations but hopefully for the rest of the world we cannot live in this smoke of subjectivity of and relativism Thank you very much, Ilya. Thank I really you. appreciate your time. Cheers.